So I'm incredibly uh, happy to be able to introduce these leading lights. Uh, Mark Reed I've known for over 10 years, and, and he is a, a leading thinker and strategist, and then I believe the number two at WPP or, or something like that. Anyway, he always seems to me to be the number two at WPP. <laughs> And he has an extraordinary uh, purview. And, and Christian, also a faithful reader of our work, as I discovered recently, um, is, is in fact the Chief Diversification Officer of ProSieben. And Thomas Hess is the Strategy Director of Bertelsmann. And all of these organizations have a view. WPP is, I believe, the biggest uh, booker of TV space on the planet. Is that right? Yes? At the, mo at the moment. At the moment, it's not a situation that's going to fade. Um, Bertelsmann is active across many different parts of the cultural space, obviously significantly in production, in television broadcasting, and Proceben, as we know, is an excellent and superb German broadcaster. So what I would like to ask you first, all of you, is, is to reflect on, on how you see your models evolving. I mean, this, this talk I gave showed that despite the growth of the internet, despite the growth of all these phenomena, there is an extraordinary resilience to the TV model, and there is also an extraordinary resilience to the connection between making and buying wonderful television and advertising, because you can actually portray what you're going to show to advertisers, whereas YouTube is only paid on results, pretty much, you know, and that is also true of all the websites and so on. So it's a different kind of advertising. I mean, do you see the TV advertising space, Mark, since you dominate it, uh, do you see it continuing to grow? So I think, um, I mean, it's true that TV has been amazingly resilient through, through the recession and coming out of the recession. You just look at the you know, ITV stock price has gone from 60p to whatever, close to two pounds in two years. You can see the kind of the psychological um, rebound in the TV market. Um, Group M's estimates, so our sort of media buying, Adam Smith is our chief economist, his estimates for next year are in the UK, five to six percent growth in the market, and TV around five, the internet, he's just upgraded to say 12 to 14. In Germany, I thought, given my two fellow panelists I find out Germany, Germany we think will grow about two percent next year. We expect internet to be about eight to nine, and TV sort of flat to a bit more. So you're seeing you know, resilience in TV, all of the you know, press down 10, 12 percent, so basically you don't want to work for a, a newspaper or magazine company, and the growth in the internet so far coming out of newspapers and magazines. Now, I, mean, I don't know whether you want to come to the YouTube question now or later, because I'm a bit more, I'd say I'm a bit more optimistic about YouTube, and, or let's say, I think the impact will have be a bit more profound and perhaps, perhaps you do, but maybe we'll come to that in a minute. No, I mean, I think we can d d discuss it uh, now if you like. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, in the UK, our estimate is, is, is that the income level is around 150 million, and it actually does align with the expenditure of YouTube on original, well, on the broadcaster deals yeah. and so on. So, you know, I'm sure that YouTube, you know, to our mind, like Netflix, it's a really interesting channel. And it's also very interesting because of the data potentiality of it. But, you know, it, it, it's, anyway, but I mean, it, it, the interesting thing about YouTube is also that it has about the equivalent space in every market apart from the US where it's a much more significant phenomenon. Yeah, I think, look, if you look at your chart that had BBC, ITV, YouTube, I'd look at that a different way. I'd say YouTube has 60 to 70% of online video viewing in most markets. And most traditional broadcasters have one to two. The BBC, which has you know, government or public money to subsidize massive investments in the internet, is higher. So in the UK, it's positioned slightly stronger. But in most markets, YouTube is 20 times the consumption of online video of the traditional broadcasters. And if you assume online, online, online. and if you assume, which I think is a fairly safe assumption, that you know, if you gave a, a, an eight-year-old an iPad with YouTube or a TV remote control, I suspect they will choose the iPad with YouTube, not the TV remote control. And that, that is going to grow and more consumption will move online. I think it's a massive sure. I mean, dislocation we, in the market. Not in two not in one year or two years or three years, but maybe in ten years. And I'm not saying that traditional broadcasters are powerless to respond to it, because obviously 
my colleagues on my left and right, and, and I'd say particularly the German broadcasters have done a lot more than the UK broadcasters to tackle it. So I just think it will be massively disruptive. And the best acquisition probably in the last 10 years by any company. If you remember, we laughed when, when Google bought YouTube, everyone laughed at it. They paid $1.6 billion for that. And yes, and they still don't report any profit on that activity. So um, I'm sure it's a long-term play. Yeah. But I, I just want to point out, Mark, that I don't know if you've realized that here and in this room, the demographics of Europe, so the median age of Germany is 43 and a half, the median age of the UK is 39, the median age of no, Japan I mean, is 40. I, I sat down I with mean, the guy that ran a newspaper. I sat down with a guy that ran a newspaper and he said, it's fine, I don't worry about the future of newspapers because people are living longer, right? Uh, it's not a, <laughs> it's no, not no, a great growth strategy for in, business. In, in a positive consumption environment, there's room for many, many layers. Mm -hmm. In a difficult macro environment, it's tough for everybody. You know, that's right. true. And can I ask you about, I mean, Mark, you mentioned ITV and this extraordinary share price rise. One of the factors in that is the rise of demand for programming in the global space. I mean, there is no doubt that ITV has shown consistent above average growth rates in exports and in sales of programming. I mean, when you look at, at your businesses in that space, are you seeing very much the same kind of phenomenon? You mean with relation to the relevance of content? With, with the, regard to the marketplace for investment and monetization and sales of original programming, original television programming? Yeah. I mean... So Fremantle and... Exactly. So. I mean, you said something very important. The British love their BBC, and I think that's very important. Generally, consumers love their content. Germans love their RTL content. French love their M6 content. They're used to the schedule. They're used to the formats. They're used to the big brands. They're used to watching Idol. They're used to watching the big events. And I think um, you have to differentiate very carefully um, you know, what, uh, where these formats are going to be displayed. That's obviously the big change. Where are these formats going to run? YouTube is short form, so it's got a very, its own very specific environment, at least for the moment. Um, I think in long form, people love the format brands, and they love to find them on whichever device they are going to use. Um, in fact, I think TV program consumption is going to go up, not down because people have more screens to watch it on, and they have, to, they have the ability to watch it while they're in a taxi or on a train or in a bus, which they weren't able to do previously. So I think actually it's a bright future for premium video content, because creating premium content is not that easy. Yes, there's going to be uh, less scarcity of distribution. It's actually good if you're a producer of content. And uh, what we see, what we've seen in music, is that yes, there's a long tail. Of course there's a long tail and a lot more consumption of very obscure things. But the funny thing is that consumption at the top of the tail actually increases, and that the really big highlights get even more consumptions. And that's, you know, fantastic. Serial drama, for example, um, has seen a revival. Why is that? Because people can watch one episode after the other, um, and if they miss it, it doesn't matter. They can always catch up. So I think it's good news for content. The content owners, particularly the TV broadcasters, have to go with the times, and I think that's very important. They have to embrace the challenge rather than sit there and, and sort of refuse to adopt to it. But if they embrace the challenge, and I think many broadcasters now do, they will come out uh, with, with a very strong position. And Christian, just turning to you, I mean, how do you see the situation in Germany evolving? It's obviously... Uh, uh, a nation with uh, 62 OTT services, so over-the-top services, and then Netflix is, is soon going to launch there. I mean, what we've seen there too is, is that there seems to be room in the German macro environment, which is a very favorable envelope, let's face it, compared to say Italy or Spain or Portugal or Greece. In that favorable environment, you're seeing everyone somehow manage to do quite well, including Sky Deutschland and, and all of your so, so even in this vast nation where there's infinite choice, the broadcasters seem to be holding up quite well. Yeah. I think, um, first of all, Germany is a very specific market. There's a very strong free-to-air offering with premium content, as Thomas mentioned. The RTL and ProSieben are kind of leading the market. That's what you see in the past with a very stable, even single digitally growing TV advertising with a good price level, increasing price level. And as Thomas said, it's really different, different content types. If you talk about premium content, to storytelling, this is exclusive to TV, mainly exclusive to TV. If you talk to YouTube, it's short forms, clips, it's a different culture on YouTube. 
And if you see the numbers, I think Germany, we see average people watch 200 minutes TV and roughly 15 online video. And out of this online video, probably 11 is YouTube and four is premium TV. So there you see, I think, the two worlds. There are the TV culture, premium content, which is close to the broadcasters, and the new YouTube web, two-minute web clips, web stars, which is mainly YouTube. And these are two worlds. Obviously, YouTube is strongly one, but YouTube will not enter the other one. And there, I also agree to Thomas, in the digital world, what we do in Germany is we are very open to all distribution forms. So we want, to, we want our content to be available on all platforms, be it mobile. Mobile enables us to see TV out of home. That's yeah. new, so you will see TV increase. We also have our own Mac store, it's our Netflix, where we start very early. So we even attack ourselves as a VOD service. We have our small YouTube, where we have like an own platform for our web stars. And we even founded a multi-channel network. So what I want to say with this, as a broadcaster in Germany, I think we're very early to enter all the different digital arenas, be it paid watch service or MCN. And thereby, I think we're very strong position. And looking at the stock, you mentioned ITV. I think Prozim went up from one to 35 euros in four years. So I think there you see the capital market likes free TV if you are open-minded to digital. I think the key question, Claire, is the question of unbundling. What's going to happen? What we've seen in music is the album has been unbundled to the individual tracks. That's been terribly painful for an industry that used to sell you 15, uh, you know, a product for $15 when sometimes you only wanted one song. Um, in magazines, I think there is a question around the bundle of the magazine. Is that still relevant? And what is that going to do? I think there's room for that, but they've got to reinvent how to do that. Uh, in television, I think the good news is the product is already digital. And there's both a brand that the broadcasters have and there's the brand that the product has. And I think you'll see a little bit more power to the brand of the individual product, which is why it's so important to be in original content production, which is why it's so important we have Fremantle, we have all our domestic production, as that presumes at Eins, where we own all the rights in perpetuity, and we are very careful about owning that content. At the same time, I think the Lighthouse brands are still going to be very important. And the, the, the disaggregation, I think, is going to happen. But you have very strong cards to play in that game going forward. Sure. Yeah. And I think, well, certainly we, we have seen that, um, again, you know, there is room in the market for short f interest in short form of all kinds. And then there is this massive interest uh, in, in very high quality long form with a huge amount of CGI. I mean, it's very hard to give the experience of the Game of Thrones adequately right. from even on a pirated phenomenon, you know, rather than having it on HD and so on. So um, I, I completely agree with you that there, and, and actually the creativity in short form is phenomenal, but so is the creativity in long form. And I don't think we're in a situation where you can get away from the formation of narrative. And I think that the weakness of a lot right. of YouTube material is an absence of narrative. It's an absence of depth. It's an absence of quality. I mean, $10 million an hour will buy you Shakespearean actors rather than Joe in his garage, you know? And, and I'm sure there, there's the equivalent, well, we can see it, the equivalent is football. So actually, I was actually going to ask you because Germany has experienced the most interesting set of moves from Deutsche Telekom into the Bundesliga and then out and so on. And as you're both extraordinary observers of the global space. I mean, what do you think is going to happen as a result of the BT move to become the dominant life form in sports TV in the UK? I think it's very hard for non-content people to get into the content business. Why are there only three majors in music and they making actually quite a good amount of money? Um, why, aren't, why did Apple not buy Universal at the time? Why does, you, why does Google not buy up more content? Um, why is Amazon, I think, quite unsuccessful at its own self-publishing initiative? And we'll see what will happen with their own productions. But it's a very specific skill. It takes a particular type of odd people, sometimes crazy people, who are assembled in a creative environment. I don't know, maybe in the long term we'll see how things evolve, and in the long term we're all dead anyway. But in the, uh, in the immediate Actually, future. Actually, you live longer by um, three months every year in 
to right now. Good news. And have done you. since 1850. <laughs> So it's one of those really entrenched trends. Don't worry about it. Thomas. I don't think it will. <laughs> don't worry about it. It won't carry us away quickly. So, Mark, what do yeah. you think about 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 the BT Sport issue? What do you think about this issue of of a telecom barging in to content and trying to carve out a massive brand space in that? Well, I think it, it's driven by kind of a desire not to be the dumb pipe, isn't it? Competitively, they've got Sky with its content. They've got Virgin with the sort of the triple play, and they're kind of driven by necessity to find a way to go through that. And I think that's the, you know, that's the easiest way through it. Time will tell whether they'll be successful in monetizing it. I and mean, we were talking about it earlier. It does seem to appeal more to one half of the population than the other half of the population, and maybe those are the people that make the, the um, broadband decisions. I don't know. What do you think, Christian? I think A, what you see in, in, in soccer sports in particular, due to the increasing prices, I think nobody can earn money with it. In Germany, you see all the commercial public, broadca uh, public bro uh, private broadcasters, they can't afford to buy Champions League. That's why it was by public, with the taxpayer money. And for Sky, I think what you find out in Germany, like there are three million soccer fans. So I think for choosing pay TV, soccer is very important because that's the emotional part where you choose a pay service. So I think for Sky, it's very important in, in Germany, and probably that's the BT strategy, that they want to a, avoid to be a dumb pipe and enter the value-add paid service arena. And I think their soccer is good, but A, they won't refinance it because they don't need to. I think that's for churn reduction or subscriber acquisition costs, it's another pool. And B, probably they will need Premier League also, and that, I assume, the rights will go up a lot. So I, mean, I think it, it's it good for the, for the soccer leagues. They will earn more money. Yeah, good for soccer players, right? Yeah. The, the it's have great for bigger soccer players. It will be very good for Bentley, basically. You're absolutely right. Um, do you know that the uh, salaries of soccer players in the UK has risen 27-fold since 2003? And with the Champions League thing and the soon-to-come EPL, it might actually double. And in fact, our view is, is that BT could well have succeeded in doubling the underlying sports rights costs in a single cycle. They still don't always win. <laughs> of course not. No, they don't. And in the end, you know, as we saw in my slide, it's only the tiniest point of consumption. But it is a very interesting move. And also, it's one from which, both in France and in Germany, the telecom incumbent, supported by public money, has been in and out of that game. But anyway, so I think that we're supposed to be wrapping up here. Is that right? I'm just looking for guidance. No, there's no guidance. Right. Can um, maybe ask a question, Claire? I mean, well, do it's you all think digital. This, it says seven minutes, twenty-six seconds there. Oh, does it? All right. Okay. Good. I didn't um, see it. Do you do you think that um, the BT Sport thing is like the next stage in unbundling of TV? Like, you know, music got unbundled from albums to singles. Let's say, newspapers got unbundled. A long time ago, is, is the BT Sport thing like the next stage of that unbundling? So Netflix is taking premium content, and if these models appear, is that, is that the future it goes? No, I, I think that's a very interesting and absolutely correct observation about one of the strands of demand in the digital age, and particularly for online delivered services, which are, are extraordinarily thematic. You know, when I put up the bubble for pornography, that is a thematic group. You know, it's, it's all of one subject. And so therefore, Netflix is kind of all of a single vibe, BT Sport as well. And I think that definitely, we've seen this in the US over and over again. There have been attempts by consumer groups to try to get cable operators to unbundle and offer on an a la carte basis. And those have all been frustrated. And in effect, in the last five years, and therefore also with a dynamic around share price like that of ProSieben, like that of WPP, like that of ITV, and if you were quoted, it would be the same for you too. There's been a massive revaluation of these cable operators and the studios, these three or four companies that originate because efforts around unbundling, in a way a family audience is viewing across such a great range. And, and actually there is, there is always a trade-off between, say, only subscribing to BT Sports. So in the UK, BT Vision, which has 18 channels and BT Sport, you know, that's come to 800,000 folk out of uh, maybe 14 million homes that subscribe between VM and Virgin Media and Sky. So, so I think there is definitely a place there. I'm, I would be surprised if it was a really significant space 
because inherently, someone who's only prepared to subscribe to one, you know, three sports channels, a very narrow range, is a singleton living at home. Now, the demographics of Europe are that young males do spend much, much longer as singletons, and many of them never stop being singletons. But still, the dominant life form is married life and family life, certainly in the UK with a rising population, rising fast, and therefore the singleton aspect is tough. But so, Claire, I don't believe in telco zoning content, just to come back to that question. Okay. I, don't think, I think it will fail. They've been in and out of it because, of, because they haven't accomplished it, uh, a success with it. I think there are specific skills. You operate a telco platform, you operate a telco platform. You operate uh, a content business, you operate a content business. Netflix is a newcomer, but they're like a new HBO. They're a new content business. Mm -hmm having made particularly good use of the digital environment and being particularly well positioned from the rental of DVDs that enabled them to get into this business. But, um, you know, and then I think the key question is on the advertising front. Will some people be so good at advertising that they'll be able to monetize better than some other content businesses? Or will there be some symbiosis? I think that's a more interesting question than I think telcos getting into it because they have no audience flow, they have no campfire, they have no brand, they're often in awkward spaces within the usual environment in which consumers look for content. Why would I go to Deutsche Telekom unless I read it someplace? I think so I, I believe more in specialization and core competency than in everybody doing everything. I, I'm sure you're absolutely right. I've often believed in that myself. I would like to ask both of you, both Mark and you, uh, Mark first please, but you know, organizations are making bespoke programming for YouTube and it is actually, much of it is actually very successful and yeah. interesting. As I said, the creative space to my mind is greatly enlarged. I mean, do you see monetization of content made for YouTube as, as a real, you know, obviously in advertising it is ubiquitous. I mean, is that, do you think that that's a, an interesting monetization area? So I think, area? Um, Does it, do you create IP in that way? So we've, you know, we've done two investments. We invested in full screen, which is, um, I think, one of the top three multi-channel networks, and also in uh, Vice, which is a kind of new, I kind of, they sort of, it's the new MTV, if you like. Right. And Vice actually perform, produce a lot of long-form content that plays extremely well. They're in the top 0.01% of length of content viewed on YouTube. I would just say that. If you compare a traditional free-to-air broadcast that knows virtually nothing about their audience with YouTube, who in theory know everything that Google knows, which is basically everything there is to know about you, you know, who you are, where you are, where you were, where you're going, what you bought, what you're searching for, you know, the data advantage that they have in monetizing audiences is, is tremendous. Right. Now, the economics are tough at the moment because the YouTube market share, you know, the YouTube share is, say, 55 and you get 45. So, or the other way around, 45 and 55. So I think that's, that makes it tough to make money out of the content. But I've no doubt, I, mean, I was with a client yesterday, and I think every one of our clients should say, what is our YouTube strategy? I mean, the two places clients that want right. to reach young people, not the increasing number of old people that you point out, um, the clients want to reach young people should be on YouTube, and they should be on mobile. And by the way, increasingly, those two things are the same because 40% of YouTube views are on mobile devices. That's where, if I was a client, one of these young people, I'd want to be investing my thinking time. Right? It's not to say TV doesn't work. Traditional TV does work. But if I want to innovate, I want to do fun things, that's where I would be focusing. I agree with Mark, and you've made terrific investments. Both Vice and Full Screen are fantastic companies. We also, through Fremantle, have uh, hundreds of millions of views on YouTube, and we've made YouTube a priority. We've invested in Broadband TV, one of the largest mm. multi-channel networks. We've invested in Style Hall, a vertical multi-channel mm -hmm. network that uh, is the leader in, um, in style and fashion. So we have about 2.5 billion video views now every month for RTL, Fremantle, Bertelsmann uh, venture um, engagements. And I think it's very important to be on that platform. But I also agree uh, that it's not monetizing very well. It's not monetizing very well because it's primarily monetizing through Google, who are not focused on premium and who are uh, very much uh, uh, you, know, fo uh, you know, focused on automated, um, uh, uh, platform-driven 
um, monetization. I was, uh, we co-founded Viva between Sony Music and Universal mm -hmm. when I was there. Mm -hmm. And we didn't monetize on YouTube at all until we hired 60 advertising people. And then suddenly there was h several hundred million dollars that came in very quickly, simply because we were going to advertisers you know, they and selling them more of a the traditional TV sale in that new environment. Yeah. That I mean, worked very well. It is there. I mean, if I look at our spend with Google, and Google will be our single largest media vendor soon, YouTube is the biggest contributed to growth of our spend on, on Google. I think they're increasing, they're focusing on it. Right. It's hard to put ads in short form content, there's no doubt. Right? But I think the content forms will get, <clears throat> inevitably get longer and the ad load will get higher. And um, you know, we were looking at the cost per thousand on CPMs. traditional TV yeah. and the cost per thousand using kind of video plus viral plus YouTube. And they're exactly the same, by the way. You know, around 15 euro between TV and online. So you know, the, the money will shift as the viewers shift. That's a very uh, interesting place to end on, on a relatively buoyant, we're all still alive, all the traditional broadcasters are still going to be fine and amazing content is still going to be served and in fact the creative space is enlarged and advertising will go where it will go. So thank you so much to our panel and thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you, Claire.